My name is Jake Walker, and I'm one of three founding members of Ballistic Architecture Machine, also known as BAM, Bayan Mu. In 2018, uh, I was lucky enough to give a presentation about uh, our redesign of the Guomao intersection. And after that presentation, that talk, uh, we got a lot of interest from Beijing to start to examine different types of urban conditions around the city. And uh, I want to kind of revisit our definition of the landscape because I think when people think of the landscape, they typically think of the green spaces, parks, wetlands, uh, and, and, and all those green areas. But also the urban landscape is uh, really the hard spaces of the city as well. We have roads, intersections, crosswalks. All of these areas are also uh, considered the landscape and it's the true material of the city. And it's what we're interested in designing. I want to kind of delve into this a little bit more because it's not often clear what it is that uh, we do. It's not clear to the general public, I, I believe. And so what we have is a kind of typical condition that you're looking at here. We have a property line, there's a site, a developer would probably buy this and then hire an architect to build the buildings that are kind of set within the site. The landscape is everything that is outside of the building and it's the, the, the space and design realm that goes up to uh, the property line and sometimes over. And I think one of the key differences about landscape is that it is fundamentally about boundaries, uh, more so than architecture, I would say, because you're always coming up against a condition that you're not necessarily sure what it is, you don't have design control over it, uh, and you kind of have to become comfortable with this uh, uncertainty. Uh, one of the realms that you come up against when you're dealing with landscape is areas that are owned by the government, such as sidewalks, streets, fulus, these kinds of things. And I think that from project to project, uh, this realm uh, kind of changes. The boundary moves back and forth. I think that uh, in, in a lot of cases, you know, when we're working on projects, this is an area that sometimes it's unclear what is going to be happening in this zone. Sometimes the developer wants to control it, sometimes the government wants to control it, and even during the course of a project, uh, you might have this boundary shifting. I don't know many buildings that when they get built afterwards, someone comes along and says, here, we're going to cut off one third of your building, but this happens a lot in the landscape when going through construction, someone will come along and say, well, you know, we're going to put a different design there. So not only is the landscape fundamentally about these kinds of boundaries, uh, the boundaries often change. Uh, the other boundaries that exist in the landscape are things that are below the ground. And in most cases, this would be a parking garage. And a landscape that's on top of a parking garage is very different than a landscape that is on solid earth. The other thing that happens is, is that because of all of these things below the city, uh, a lot of different elements come up, uh, utilities, vents, fire exits, uh, and all of these kinds of things that are part of the urban landscape. And these are things that architects get to ignore. And it's the things that we actually have to deal with. So if you were to kind of zoom out uh, and look at a kind of generic urban condition, what you would start to find, even in the areas that are you know, under the government purview, uh, is, is that there are many, many, many different kinds of boundaries that are existing. So even uh, you know, main roads. Arterial roads are typically under the purview of a, a central or a city government. Uh, as opposed to sidewalks, fulus would be under a district or sub-district government. Uh, parks are under the Landscape Bureau. Waterways are under the Water Bureau. And so what you're looking at in terms of a realm is something that has all of these invisible lines that are dividing up uh, you know, who has control over it. But when we're looking for solutions in the landscape, we can't be hemmed in or controlled or defined by all of these many, many, many boundaries. And so that's why our definition of the landscape uh, and what we're really working to design is all of the spaces in between the buildings. So originally I had wanted to actually talk about a few of the different types of things that we were asked to look at in Beijing, but I'm going to actually focus on this one, which is the Gongti Beilu Street as it goes through the Sanlitun intersection. And you may remember uh, in 2018 when we gave uh, the talk for the uh, Guomao intersection, one of the reasons that we started looking at it is because BAM was originally near Gulo and we had moved across the city to Shuangjing and we had to commute through the Guomao intersection uh, regularly for a period of time and that's when it kind of opened our eyes to this issue and we decided, you know what, we can 
do this better, we can do it, create a better design for this. About six years ago, BAM then moved uh, to the Sun Tun district. And so uh, we were quite excited to be asked to uh, kind of examine this. And, and for me, it's even a little bit more personal because I walk to work, I'm a walker. And uh, I think that that's very important. Uh, and every day I walk to work, I walk down Gongti Beilu, I walk through the intersection, and then I go down, turn south, and go towards the office. So this is a condition that every single day for the last six years, I look at you know, two, three times a day and think about, and it was a great honor to be asked uh, to kind of consider this area. And I think one of the things that's interesting about this district, that it, it has evolved over time. And uh, it's very different than say the Beijing CBD, which used to be factories, and then they said, let's make a central business district, and just boom, right there. This district is something that kind of evolved over time to what it has become, which is this kind of entertainment uh, commercial area. And I think one of the key things basically catalyzed this was uh, the fact that it is Beijing's second embassy district. And so this evolution started to occur because there were different cultural conditions coming in for diplomatic reasons. You know, you have the embassies and then the people that work in the embassies come from different countries and they have different, uh, you know, ways of you know, having fun or different types of food, uh, different ways of kind of living. And so what happened is, is that this district started to evolve in ways that were different from other parts of the city. And uh, I, I think it's because of this cultural melting pot. And so what this does is it creates a kind of condition in the city where experimentation was always kind of uh, permitted or accepted. And I think that it is continuing to evolve, which is uh, actually, you know, why we're uh, asked to kind of focus on this. And if you look at this condition, what you see is something, you know, very much like I was explaining before, which is, is that the whole area is broken up into, you know, different, uh, I guess, players, essentially. So the main road, Gongti Beilu, goes east-west, and it's an arterial road, so that's under the purview of uh, the Chaoyang or even potentially the Beijing government, as opposed to the roads and the Fulus and, and the sidewalks are all part of the San Litun uh, sub-district. And then, of course, you have all the various players. You have Taiku Li, you have, uh, you have Soho, San Litun Soho on the south, Tongyin, Zhongguo Hongjie, you have uh, the D DRC, Diplomatic R Residency Compound, and even a, a military posting and a few other things in here. So there's a lot of different people that, uh, you know, are engaging with this space. And we don't want to be hemmed in by all of these boundaries which actually do exist. And so one of the things that we started focusing on was actually the poles, because the poles were something that basically is a manifestation of this condition uh, where there are many different, I guess, governmental entities in control of different elements. So you have a pole for lights, you have a pole for signage, you have a pole for the bus, you have a pole for security cameras, you have a pole for almost every function. So this this creates a significant amount of clutter uh, in the district. And so our uh, initial proposal, our first thing was let's get all these agencies together and make them agree to essentially use one poll. And so the idea was is that we designed one poll that could be varied and manipulated uh, you know, to uh, account for all of the various requirements. Uh, and then these uh, kind of cleaned up polls would then go down the street and would start to begin to kind of unify the district. And then in certain areas, they could become almost like gateways because as you go along Gongti Beilu, basically you're going through different sub-districts of the city so they could almost be like gateways into each sub-district. The other thing is, is that there's a lot of urban furniture that's kind of strewn around. Basically, you have uh, you know, kiosks, you have cones, you have bollards, you have bus stations, you have signage, uh, bike stops, all this sort of stuff is part of the urban landscape. And uh, bollards is something that I, I will talk about a little bit more. But uh, you can see the, the function of a bollard is basically to stop cars but allow for people to go through. And you can see uh, in these images, bollard on one side is different than the other. And then on, on one of these images, basically there's just like a jumble, different times, different places, different locations. Some come out, you get replaced. And then you see here on, on, on this image, Basically, you have three bollards in the exact same place, 
essentially doing the exact same thing, uh, but they're different materials, different styles, probably done at different times. And what we decided to do was try to create a kind of family of these urban objects or furniture that w created a kind of cohesive identity uh, and then could be placed around fixed bollards, movable bollards, uh, trash cans, bus stations, uh, kiosks, magazine kiosks, seating elements, and of course the reimagination uh, of the classic Beijing fence, which we kind of redesigned to be uh, within this, you know, stylistic language. There are new metros coming in, in into this district, so the idea that some of the architectural elements, the new metro line stations, would also be in cohesion with this design style, and uh, as well as the police stations, which are kind of uh, around the district in various areas. And this also started to lead us to thinking about, well, maybe even the police of this district could even have their own style. So uh, we thought about, you know, the, the, the San Luton police style, and we, we came up with a few options for this one. This one is a little bit more SWAT team, and I think that uh, that wasn't that good of an idea because it's a, it, it, it kind of seems like it poses a, a security risk. And so we ended up opting more for like the friendly service personnel. You know, that uh, you can ask for directions. Which way do I go? My cat is stuck in the tree. You know, and, and kind of a, a friendly environment, a uh, police uniform that fit with the whole uh, identity of the district. You know, because we were kind of going everywhere here with our designs. Uh, we then were, of course, asked to, well, what do we do with the facades of these old buildings? How do we give them a facelift? And I think one of the things that's very interesting is a lot of these are, are you know, look out onto the landscape spaces, the main space of Gongti Beilu. And I think that we were interested uh, in allowing the people to choose their own own windows because people that's that's how they do it, right? Some people have a balcony, some people have a cage, some people have a pigeon coop, some people have all these different things. And so we wanted to allow for that uh, kind of flexibility for the owners to choose, but we kind of created a kit of parts that people could choose different things. Uh, and then when they all came together, it was kind of a colorful patchwork, a kind of overall gestalt of the you know thing. So we looked at um, colored options as well as just black and white patterned options. And I think you know that's all fun and good. That that creates a kind of interesting new. Uh, design element, an interesting new district, but I, I think one of the key problems uh, that we wanted to solve and we knew we needed to solve was that of the traffic. And this was something that we worked on for the Guomao intersection uh, as well, uh, which is actually one of the worst traffic points in the city. And according to CGTN, actually, uh, the San Luton intersection is also one of the worst proponents of bad traffic in the city. And so here we have the intersection. East-West is Gongti Beilu. The North-South is San Luton Bay and San Luton Nan. And then, uh, so there's a lot of automobile traffic because it's an arterial road. And uh, there's a lot of pedestrian traffic going North-South across the intersection because of the various commercial districts and bars and restaurants and all the things happening on either side of the street. So primarily pedestrians North-South, primarily uh, automobiles east-west. About four years ago, a fence was put into the middle of the intersection, and I think this was an initial good idea to prevent automobiles from going north-south across there. But there was a whole series of knock-on effects that occurred. So one of them was is that it's very difficult for people to pass through these kind of pinch points, and it would create long congested lines, and then uh, people couldn't get across the intersection fast enough. And then the scooters and bikes also have to pinch through this area. It creates uh, congestion. And then because uh, you know, there are so many people in the intersection and the Fulus tend to be quite slow, what happens is that people start to crowd out and go into the intersection waiting to cross. And the more and more people gather, then the more and more difficult it is for cars to turn. And then you have this uh, kind of crossing condition where people go from the passing lane all the way on the left-hand side and make right turns and go all the way uh, you know, across the Fulu and this kind of crossing situation, there's too many options for drivers, basically. The bus stations are too close to the intersection. intersection. So what happens is that when uh, the buses stop, there's a few buses in line, it starts to congest up the intersection itself. And this one is a strange one, but uh, if you were to take the bus, uh, there would be no way for you to get off the bus and then get to a sidewalk, or you couldn't get to the bus from the sidewalk. What you have to do is you have to walk into the intersection and then walk down on the road to get to the bus station, which, you know, is nonsensical. 
And so one of the things that, uh, you know, the way Beijing tends to solve these problems, as well as many, many cities in China, is basically you do a bridge or you do a tunnel. And one of the issues with this is, is that it doesn't address one of the major user groups of the intersection, which is the cycle. Now, it's not just people you know, commuting to work. This is also a functioning aspect of the economy. You have Xuanfeng and deliveries and parcels. You have Waimai food. And uh, with so many restaurants in the district, the amount of uh, cycle traffic is a huge part of this. And having a tunnel or a bridge creates problematic issues. Now, there were two proposals done for bridges. Now, these weren't our, our proposals, uh, and we were not really for these options because we felt that they would really destroy the continuity of the district, and they also don't serve the cycles very well because what happens is the, the question, do you let the cycle go through the intersection? If you let it go through, then the people will just follow and there's no point of having a bridge. Or you make the cycles go up and then the bridges become these giant things that have these long ramps to uh, get you know, all the bikes to go up them. The other issue is that of the tunnel. Now, the tunnel is a slightly better option, although it is more expensive. And, um, and it still has this problem of the cycles. What do you do with bikes? Um, but I also think there is a kind of larger conceptual problem, which is the tunnel has the potential to be corrupted by retail. And I think it's a problematic idea that we're you know, trying to solve issues of the urban landscape with shopping all of the time. I mean, sometimes it's good. Shopping can like activate a space, but it's, it shouldn't be our go-to to uh, you know, try to solve a problem and then just put shopping in there. It's a little too capitalistic for me. One of the things that's really important to remember is the walkability of this district. Now, Beijing is known for being horrible for walking. You, you make the mistake, I'm gonna go around the block and it takes three hours. But I, I think that um, there are a few pockets in the city that have fantastic walkable conditions. You have around Gulo, you have around Rutan, you have Sanlitun, and then you also have Chijou Ba and some of those other zones. So there are these pockets and they're super precious. They're super important to kind of uh, you know, save the walkability of these areas. And this is a report that was done by Taiku Swire, who's right on this intersection. This is available online. And basically, they develop a metric, which is called intersection density. Uh, and basically what that means is, is that their block has many little streets, which means that they have many little intersections. And they make a correlation between the walkability of their district, the amount of intersections in their district, and their commercial success of their development. Our idea was that we wanted to propose a scramble cross, not a bridge, not a tunnel. Just let's use the intersection and, and kind of redesign it. And the way that the scramble cross works is like it's being shown right here. The cars stop and the people go. The people stop and the cars go. It's pretty straightforward. It's extremely simple to get these things working. You just have to really be committed to it. In, in London, the Oxford Circus was renovated from a traditional intersection to a scramble cross. And this started happening in China you know, er early on as well. So 2007, I believe, was the first scramble cross in Hangzhou, 2011, Changzhou, Yangzhou, uh, Wuhan 2014, Changsha 2018, and being in Shanghai, we all know that uh, Shanghai has many of these. And in fact, by 2018, Shanghai had 11 or more of these successful scramble cross intersections in the center of very dense urban conditions. Compared to Beijing, same year, 2018, Beijing got their first scramble cross, but it's not even in the city center. It's way, 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 way out there. And so I think that, uh, keep in mind that this was about the same time that uh, you know, we are trying to push this idea that this intersection can become one of these. Uh, and Beijing just got their very first. And so I think the key thing that we're, we're interested in is, is that we don't want to bring anything to this. We don't want to you know, put architecture here. We don't want to you know, put a tunnel in there and then make it all shopping. What we want to do is we want to actually utilize the activity, the energy uh, of this landscape, of these people, and make this the kind of focal element. This is the icon of the district. And so the design was, was actually quite simple. It's this kind of celebrated crosswalk 
uh, with this feature hanging in it that's this kind of light element. And you can see, I'll point out here, that we have three lines, one line, two lines, and then three lines of ballers, which basically uh, limit the amount of choices drivers can make, but then allow for cycles and people to go in any which direction. Uh, this is a kind of aerial view of that, a physical model of that same thing, and then this kind of light object that would turn on when people needed to cross. Unfortunately, you know, we did many, many, many presentations, and we were really trying to get this to work. And, and, and you know, some people were saying, oh, yeah, maybe, I don't know. And, you know, after six, seven months of really uh, presentations every week trying to push this, uh, gain kind of, you know, a consensus about this, um, basically, and then they said, okay, get ready. We're going to do a big presentation. You're going to talk to the mayor or something like that. And then, so we're ready. Our books, our presentation all ready. And then, and then we waited. And then we waited weeks. And then we waited months. And then it was six months. And then it was a year. And we never got called ever again. No, no one picked up the phone. No one wanted to see the design result. Nothing ever happened. And so once we realized that uh, we weren't getting called, we decided that we were going to start working on it again uh, and, and just really figure this out. Because for us, this was an important topic that just couldn't be left, you know, like we were dropped like a wet, a wet bag or something. You know, we, we had to do this. And so when we started working on this again, independently, basically we started by counting the intersection and uh, we came to uh, you know, a basic uh, number where it's about 11,000 people per hour on average and 3,300 cars on average. And it's heavily weighted uh, to the west side, a lot of people crossing on that west side. And so we worked with Systematica, who is actually the traffic engineer that helped us on the Guamal project as well. And um, basically, they created a simulation of the existing condition. And then what we did is we worked with them to uh, try out different organizations to see which one was going to be the most successful. So the first three you can see are all different types of scramble crosses. And the, the, the last one is just a, a little bit more of a traditional intersection with some modifications, extra bollards and things like that. So the first option was a much more kind of traditional scramble cross. This is actually very similar to our design. Uh, and then uh, the second option where the medians are utilized. A third option where these kind of central uh, islands that then get used, people collect in the central islands and then cross over the center of the intersection. And then the fourth option was uh, essentially like a, a, a modification to a traditional intersection. Uh, on the left-hand side here on both of these, this is automobiles, this is pedestrians, uh, is the existing condition. So you can see that uh, in terms of time, all of the options we propose are both better for automobiles as well as pedestrians. So on the left-hand side, one and three were uh, the best for pedestrians, actually a whole minute faster in walking across the inter intersection because of the less congestion. And for the cars, it was options one and four that were uh, most efficient for the automobile traffic. So clearly option one uh, was the, the sort of most suitable for both automobile and pedestrian. So we kind of went with that option to further develop it. And the way that this basically works is, is that uh, in essence, what we're doing is, is that we're utilizing those bollards, these things here that stop cars from going but allow people to go, and we're minimizing the passing lane but increasing the fulu by another lane. So the fulu is two or three lanes in this condition, and the passing lane is actually a little bit smaller. Um, and this allows uh, for less choices for cars, but people can walk through, and then, of course, the bikes can just go through whichever way they uh, so desire. Uh, and so this is a kind of stop motion animation as, as that we kind of imagined how it would work. So of course first the cars go one direction, the next direction, and then the light turns on and the little green men walk around the light and everyone can uh, go across the intersection, turns red, and then turns off. So that was the kind of general idea about this sequence. Um, and lo and behold, this just happened. We, we never got called ever again. And just four weeks ago, was walking home from the office, and boom, 
they're renovating the intersection. I mean, I was happy and sad. <laughs> because I was really interested to see what of our idea were they actually going to use, if any of them. And it's great to see that uh, something was actually happening. I, I, would, I would have liked that they actually asked us to do it, but that wasn't the case. And one of the interesting things that is happening now is, is that when these renovations occur, uh, you can scan a QR code Right. And then it takes you to a website where you can vote and, and they can kind of test out if people like it. And one of the questions that is on this, this is actually, uh, should we make this a scramble cross? Because the thing is, is that the intersection has been renovated, but they're not yet operating it as a scramble cross fully. It's, a, it's in this kind of in between area. Uh, that is a little bit confused and so I'm going to talk a little bit about that because I think it's important for people not to see some dysfunctional aspects and then say well you know the that doesn't work we tried it uh, because I think it's really hasn't been fully committed to and gone all the way really trying to make it work it's a kind of half measure it's a little bit like a facelift but no changes to the structure and so one of the things that uh, you know, our proposal had, I was talking about these bollards, uh, which would help this is to continue to try to limit the options that cars had. And so uh, the placement of a line of bollards between the passing lane and the extended Fulu area. And this would stop cars from doing this turn that they tend to do and, and a lot of traffic that occurs from that. So this is exactly that condition. So what happens is people cross the intersection and then you get cars backing up all the way into the main part of the road. The bollards would actually s kind of s stop that from happening. And then you have this crossing condition where turns people may make, like in this one, make a wide turn and then basically turn out and stop all the cars from uh, being able to pass through. There's a lot of drop-off conditions, people quickly getting out of their car because of all the shopping around here. Uh, and this does create some congestion and the bus stations uh, had not been relocated and so this is actually what we have here is you it's a little tough to see but this is three buses lined up waiting to get to the bus station and the last bus is basically in you know kind of encroaching on the intersection itself not only that but this light is horribly confusing it's red and green at the same time and I, I don't know what you're supposed to do. You go, do you stop? I mean, I guess if you're going that way and it's red, you're supposed to stop. And if you're going that way, it's green. But that's not what it looks like. It just looks like red and green at the same time. So it just, it's, it's like making the situation more confusing. Uh, and then we also have some of these signaling issues that are happening. So what we have here is the cars have two yellow lights. The bicycle has a yellow light. A red light is in your field of vision, and the pedestrians have a green light. It's literally every possible color at once. So, I mean, I don't even know what people are supposed to do here. And, you know, the thing is interesting, people figure these things out, right? They just kind of start using it the way it's supposed to be using and it just ignoring the lights altogether. It's like, whatever, no cars, I'm going. You know, so I think that the, you know, this is again a similar situation where the north-south turns green. And what happens is, is that they make red for the cars for in both directions which is great which means that it's basically a scramble cross it's 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 almost there except then they make the light for this pedestrian east west also red and of course people see that all the cars are stopped and then they just walk across so the thing is is, is that it's basically being used as a scramble cross but no one wants to admit it. And then the next step is all the lights turn green. And then what you have is peoples and car both having green at the same time. And this could be very easily fixed. It's just a programming switch. You know, this turns green at this time and that is a signaling thing, really easy to fix. So it's really close, it's almost there, but there's a kind of commitment to really doing the idea that doesn't quite exist. But it's not all bad. I mean, I think that one of the things that's important is, is that it is improving, right? I mean, this is what the, the, those corners looked like before, poles and bollards and fences and all this stuff. And, you know, on the other image, you're starting to see it's, it's opening up. It's, it's getting easier to utilize. And there are some 
interesting ideas that we were proposing that be done uh, and it's great to see them working. Now, again, this isn't our design because no one ever called us again, but uh, I think it's really important to look and see, okay, like this is something that we had proposed and it's working. You see the bikes going across in the background, you see the people going across and then the cars are, you know, are, are limited to this direction. In our design, we actually had more of these where there's a line on this side and a line on that side. And I still believe that that would, uh, you know, limit the choices that automobiles can make and, 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 and create a better intersection. Think about this in relationship to the previous proposal that we had for the Guomao intersection, which we also did a lot of this traffic simulation and work. And uh, I think uh, one of the things about the Guomao intersection was is that it was purely a theoretical proposal. Uh, we did a lot of extra work to move it away from being a pure utopian idea but fundamentally, it was still theoretical. I mean, we had some people come up to us, let's build it. It's like, okay, go for it. Uh, but I think that, you know, the purpose of it wasn't that we were expecting that it would be built. The purpose of it was to make people see these spaces differently, to understand, uh, you know, the urban landscape, understand these spaces of the city and imagine that they could be different. And that was the purpose of that project. The Samlitun intersection in Gongti Beilu is different. This can be done. This can be implemented. And in the few ideas that we see working, we know that if it is truly committed to, it fundamentally can work. And actually, it's one of the most cost-effective options. It's not even an necessarily have to be an issue uh, of cost. So these are kind of different in that sense. We're, we're examining the, la the urban landscape, but you know, one was just really about getting people to focus on, on this issue, and the other is actually a, a feasible, workable solution. And I think that one of the things is there still exists this massive gap between the idea of uh, a design and uh, the physical built condition. And I think one of the things is, is that people imagine that uh, landscape is kind of like a, a, almost like a frosting or like something to make engineering look beautiful. And so essentially the street has to be this engineered thing. It has to be engineered and then you use trees and lights to make it look pretty. And I think that that is a funda fundamental misunderstanding of what it is that uh, we're designing when we're designing the urban landscape because I think it creates a negative feedback cycle that anything that has aesthetic value uh, you know, is considered to potentially not be functional. And I, I think that that is a problematic stance because in a lot of these cases, um, we're trying to fix problems created by engineering. Uh, and so engineering alone is not going to be able to solve these problems. There, it, it has to be done together with you know, landscape thinking and design. The other aspect is something that I started with, which is all of the different boundaries and divisions that exist within the urban landscape. And I think that this is something that makes it quite difficult for any one voice or any one vision to really make it through uh, and be built according to that, uh, you know, desire. It's, it's a much more polyphonic uh, realm. And so when we're thinking about the urban landscape, we, we don't, uh, you know, want to be defined by these boundaries, but these boundaries also exist and it makes it difficult, uh, you know, in, in cases to, to get these things done. And so I think one of the questions you might ask is, why do you do this to yourself? I ask myself this all the time. Uh, you know, why do you work in a realm that is so difficult to get things constructed? Why do you work in a realm where it's so easy to have a design taken and then changed beyond recognition? You know, why do we work in a realm that it's so difficult to retain any form of authorship or credit for the ideas and the thinking that you do? And why do we work in a realm that people don't even know what it is? You know, I mean, people look at a building, oh, a building, got it. But urban landscape, what, you know, this weird realm, and, and, and it takes more patience and it takes more time to explain what it is that we do. And I think the reason that we do this is because we think it's really, really important. We believe that the urban landscape is potentially one of 
uh, the most important design realms of the 21st century. It's much more important than skyscrapers and shopping malls. The point is, is that if we want to create a more productive relationship to the natural world, to the unbuilt world, we really have to get a better understanding of the world that we actually construct for ourselves, uh, our constructed environment as well. Uh, and so what we try to do is bring people's focus to this realm and see the constructed world in a different way. And uh, I think that's why we do what we do. Thank you.